All right. So uh, this talk, um, as you've seen on the Meetup page and whatnot, is called Nearly Native. Um, you know, we're JavaScript developer, developers, at least most of us are. Anyone out here develop any uh, native iPhone, Android apps, anything like that? OK, so we got a couple hands. Um, anybody develop with JavaScript, if you could raise your hand. OK, so we got a lot, we got a lot of folks uh, here develop with JavaScript. Um, and I, I'm, I'm here primarily to talk about tools. Um, over, over the past couple of years, and really over the past year, there's been a huge acceleration in what's out there to help us build um, you know, not just performant apps, but apps that look really good. Um, and it lets us do it with the language that we use really every day, um, JavaScript. So my name is Josh Bouchard. You can follow me on Twitter if you like stream of consciousness inside jokes pertaining only to myself, um, or things about JavaScript, that type of thing. Uh, but that's me. Um, but let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about JavaScript um, kind of seeping into everything, right? Um, you know, we've got it on the server side. You can write uh, entire games in JavaScript now. Um, you know, you can, you can program drones with it. Of course, you know, you can build websites with it. I don't know if you knew that. Um, you know, microcontrollers like Tesla I.O. we saw during the lightning talks. Um, last session, um, and robots, all those sorts of things. What I'm talking about today is mobile apps, right? Uh, mobile apps are huge, uh, but writing them with web tech is kind of hard, right? Um, there's, uh, there's different tools that we have, like uh, you know, jQuery Mobile, um, different things like that, but we face a lot of tricky issues with developing, which I'll get into that uh, now, I suppose. Um, with better tools actually comes the ability to, uh, to write better apps, right? Um, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm highly dependent on all of the tools that I use every day, um, and uh, I'm, I'm here to talk a few about, uh, about a few of them that come up this year. So uh, please ask questions. Um, I, I want to make this as interactive as possible, uh, especially with mobile app development. Um, it's not like you can just you know, very quickly download Xcode and all the proper uh, SDKs and sort of follow along with me. Um, that, that's sort of the challenge of this type of talk. Um, but please ask questions as we go. Um, correct me. I'm a human being. I can get things wrong. Um, please speak up. Um, and if you have any insight, uh, anybody out there developing hybrid apps right now? OK, so we got a few. Uh, if, if you have any insight, anything that is, is kind of pertaining to the slide that you see up, uh, up in front of you, please uh, speak up if you, if you have something valuable that you think you'd like to add. Um, if you do these things, I have a box of, uh, of strawberry Pop-Tarts. Uh, I thought long and hard about what would uh, incentivize me to you know, kind of speak up and give my two cents. Um, <laughs> and so if, if you would like Pop-Tarts, I, I checked Wikipedia. That one's actually raspberry. I don't want to false advertise, but I do have a box of, uh, of strawberry right here. Um, and also the other goodie, um, as mentioned earlier, we have Ionic stickers at the back table. Um, and we'll be talking about Ionic, I guess, in a minute. I'm jumping the gun there. Uh, but let's talk real quick about sort of how you can get an app on a mobile device, right? Um, really, you kind of have three options, and the third option is really like 10 options. But um, we've got uh, native apps. We've got pure, strictly web apps. You know, they're not in an app store. And then we've got hybrid, uh, which is a mix of the two. So let's start with native. Um, you know, you, you kind of uh, pick your language depending on the platform. You've got uh, on iOS, maybe Objective-C. Uh, I guess Swift is another one now uh, that they just announced. Haven't really looked too much into that, but anyone excited about Swift? OK, a few people excited about Swift. I know nothing about Swift. Um, maybe I should put that on there. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, kind of your option for iOS. Uh, you know, more so Java on Android. I think C-sharp for, for Windows Phone 8. Uh, I know nothing about Windows Phone, really, um, but, but there's that. Uh, a, a big advantage, you have access to kind of the full device API. You get to, to live on the cutting edge uh, of, of really whatever's being put out there by whatever company is making it. 
Um, you get to distribute in app stores, you get to sell, you get to do in-app purchases. Um, it's, uh, it's a great revenue stream and it's a great way for your app to get discovered. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of opportunity for code reuse, right? If you're developing in a different language on different platforms, you know, you, you kind of have to rewrite it three times or maybe 2.8 times, something like that. Uh, on the right, I have uh, Apple's movie trailer app. Um, I picked this as an example because it's made by Apple uh, and it turns out it's really hard to tell if something's purely native or if something is kind of using web views, different things like that in the App Store now. I figured it was pretty safe with this, but uh, it, it's actually kind of getting harder to tell. I hear in iOS 8, for example, uh, not iOS 8, um, what's, the, what's the new OS 10? Yosemite. Uh, I guess Messages is going to be a web view now, um, and so it's not strictly native necessarily anymore. So that's my best guess for, for a pure native app, but again, it's getting harder to tell, uh, which is kind of the reason that I'm having this talk uh, to begin with. Uh, and then we've also got web apps. Uh, this is cloudup.com, um, and I've got, kind of got the animation showing. Uh, I can install it to my phone as an app on my home screen. I can open it back up, um, and uh, it, it, it looks and, and sort of feels like you know, it, it, it flows nicely in there. Um, install really isn't that straightforward. Um, if, if you can catch, I guess, this half of the animation, um, it's, it's, it's kind of hidden in the options there. Um, you know, it's not an app stores. It's not like you can, you have a very easy sales, a distribution channel. Um, but uh, yeah, so I guess that's, that's one of the, the big downfalls of it. In-app purchases, not really a big thing. Um, and so there's, there's a better way than web. Does anybody know the answer to that? I have, I have no idea, actually. Is that, is that both Android and like iOS or? Okay, and, and I guess for the recording, because we are recording, uh, the, the question was, is there, uh, and I guess we can hop back to web here real quick. Um, the question was, is there a more streamlined way to add web apps to uh, like your home screen? Um, and we got an answer that there are some plugins to sort of uh, maybe put in a banner up top that will um, you know, streamline that process so that you don't need to go through uh, tedious steps. But anyway, thank you for that. Here, let me... Uh, you, you both get pop charts, a question and answer. There's, there's only what? There's six, and so we're 30% we're through. You can skip you. Would you like a pop chart? No? Nope. you want? All right. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> All right. And uh, what, I'm uh, what I'm here to talk to you about today uh, are hybrid apps. Uh, just like web apps, um, as I'm sure you know, uh, you get to use HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, you get access to common device APIs, but uh, not necessarily everything. You kind of have to wait for a plugin to come out. It's, it's sort of depending on what, what vehicle you're using to actually deploy uh, in, into the app store of your choice. Uh, you get to distribute in different app stores, uh, and you get to do a lot of code reuse. Um, you're probably going to want to tweak your design for different platforms. You, know, you don't want something too iOS-y. Uh, on Android, it may feel a little out of place there. Um, and so, you know, maybe instead of writing it twice to get it on two platforms, or once on two platforms, maybe 1.2, 1.3 times you would write it. Um, there's different vehicles uh, to uh, kind of 
put your app, uh, put your web app into a hybrid shell. Essentially what it is is a native app with a web view inside of it uh, and your app essentially runs in the web view. So, so there, there are different degrees of hybrid, right? Um, and kind of one that sort of jumped out at me uh, recently, um, you know, you all know Basecamp, um, or maybe you don't. Uh, it's uh, they 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 have uh, you know mobile apps out, um, and they actually did a mix of native navigation for their most recent version with um, you know web content as as the view. Um, part of this has to do with the fact that um, you know especially on older devices, and I'll get to speed in a second. Um, on older devices, you know, the navigation may not feel as snappy if it is, you know, completely part of the web view. Um, and so they kind of found a happy medium there. Um, there there's a certain slowness associated with hybrid. It's, it's a lot less now today than it was, you know, maybe even a year or two ago. Um, but uh, older devices really have it rough, right? Um, they lack the processing power that today's phones have. Um, and uh, even kind of the JavaScript engines may not be quite as optimized and up to date. Um, and anybody remember there were articles like back in 2012, Facebook had decided to switch from their uh, hybrid web view based app to something completely native. Um, and this was, you know, two years ago. Um, I don't know if the same decision would be made today. I have no idea. Um, but part of it had to do with um, sort of that slower performance aspect. Um, and like I said, devices are getting exponentially faster these days. The gap between a native app uh, and uh, a hybrid app using web views uh, in terms of speed is, is shrinking. Um, and part of that is the devices themselves. Part of it is uh, JavaScript engines also getting faster. Uh, hybrid can be kind of ugly, right? You're sort of lacking a, uh, you know, when you develop for native, uh, a lot of times the platform uh, maker will have, you know, predefined components for you to use, uh, different things like that, and you don't so much have that if you're basing it completely off of JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Um, desktop UI tools, when you're developing, you know, a normal desktop website, don't necessarily apply to mobile. Desktop UI concepts aren't necessarily tailored to mobile. Just because your, your website is responsive doesn't mean it, uh, it has good enough design to be you know, a full-fledged mobile app. Uh, there's also weird considerations too, right? Um, uh, some of you may be familiar with the 300 millisecond delay. Um, when you're tapping through, uh, it, it, it makes things feel slow, sluggish. Um, there are ways around that type of thing. Um, but they're not immediately obvious. Um, there, there's very few tools that let you right out of the box kind of dive in uh, and, and skip some of those things. Um, like I mentioned at the start of the talk, uh, I'm here to talk about tools. Uh, Hybrid now has awesome tools. Um, the, the focal point of my talk is the Ionic framework today. Uh, Ionic is based on AngularJS. Um, which, who, who here has dabbled in AngularJS? Just a quick show of hands, okay. Um, and so it's built on AngularJS, which is awesome. Uh, we use it at work. Uh, it's, it, it has made productivity go through the roof. Um, and I'm also gonna be talking about Cordova, which, uh, how many of you have heard of Cordova? How many have heard of PhoneGap? Pretty much the same thing, right? Um, and so, what Cordova is going to do is let us take our um, app based on web technologies, wrap it in a native shell, uh, and ship it to the phone of our choice. First thing I want to talk about out of those three, um, and since Ionic, like I said, is the focal point of my talk, Ionic is very, very, very heavily based on AngularJS. Um, and so I want to really quick cover uh, the basics of what that is um, very, very quickly just to get folks somewhat up to speed so you know, nobody's too lost. So what is it? Uh, let me pop over. Okay, so I'm just going to head right on over to angularjs.org. I'm going to talk about the basics. They, nobody can explain it better than this to just get a really quick rundown, right? Um, so Angular is essentially a, a front-end framework that gives you 
uh, a lot of fantastic things, right? Um, we've got our HTML document here. We declare up top that uh, it's an Angular application, um, include our Angular script. Uh, and one of the big features in Angular is data binding, right? So we've got the code on the left, uh, and we have the actual execution on the right. So you see here we've got name and a text box. You'll see in the text box that we have an attribute called ng-model. Uh, and that'll bind uh, whatever is in the text box to, uh, to the model on the scope, right? And so whatever I type here, ng-model, your name, will be available here, hello, your name, um, and it'll update live, right? So, hello, Joshua, Shua. Wow, forgot a name. Um, and so, uh, this has a lot of implications just in, in using Angular in general, but this is kind of one of the go-to things that people first show off is real-time data binding. Um, and uh, just to look, take a real quick look at a, uh, an example of like a to-do list app, right? We declare that it's an Angular app at the top. We include, um, we include the library itself. Um, we have todo.js, which we'll hop into in a second. And actually, we'll hop in right now. So uh, here we declare a to-do uh, to list controller. Um, we inject scope, which is essentially a, a place that we keep our models, right? Um, and so when you go up top, back to the first example, ng model your name um, would exist within the controller at scope dot your name. Um, and so you can modify, um, you know, uh, models on the front end using scope uh, in the controller. And so here I've got uh, scope dot to dos. So we're going to start off by populating a to do list. Um, one is learn Angular. Is it done? Yes. Uh, the next is build an Angular app, done, false. So when it's done, yes, we have a checkbox. Um, well, we have checkboxes in both of those instances. Um, and here I can actually hop back to, to this here. So uh, I'm, I'm actually going to hop a little bit back and forth. So right here we have a, uh, a list because it's a to-do list. Um, we're going to repeat through to-do in to-dos. This to do's right here is referring to scope dot to do's, which you saw in the controller. Um, we have input type checkbox. We're doing ng model again, right? So when you have a checkbox and you you bind it to something, uh, you get a boolean, true or false. Um, and so since we declared that one is done, one is not in the controller, um, it's automatically updated in our actual to do app here. Um, we also have a, we're also able to dynamically update our class, right? So class done to do dot done. So this would either be done true or done false. And if we hop over to to do dot CSS done true, we're going to put a line through it and color it gray. Um, so we can also have dynamic styles in there too. Um, and there's that. And then uh, we also have, we can also bind functions to the scope, right? Um, and so if we go on down to add to do, this is a function. Uh, essentially, all that it does is uh, take a look at what you have written uh, here and what you've bound to the input. Uh, and we just push it right into scope.todos. Um, so give a talk about Angular. And so that's bound to the scope. We hit add. It is running this function, and it is simply pushing it to that to do's array. Um, we can also have other functions like scope.remaining uh, is a function that will count how many to-dos uh, have not been done. Um, and then we can also archive to-dos, um, different things like that. We won't get too far into that. Um, but it, the point is it very quickly lets you build a very dynamic, um, you know, very real-timey uh, style apps, I guess. Let me pop on over here. So Angular is blowing up. Uh, this, is a, this is a Google Trends uh, chart that I made. Um, we have a kind of starting beginning of 2011, things start to tick up. We've got the dark ages before that, before any uh, front end frameworks. Those lines correspond to things like uh, Backbone, Knockout, Ember.js, Angular. 
Um, and so before that time, we didn't really have much of those uh, written in papyrus, because that's dark ages, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, and so I, I only labeled one on this graph. Um, you know, we've got, uh, we've got Angular in blue, and it is, it is skyrocketing uh, above all the rest. That's not to say that these other frameworks are bad by any means. There's a lot of awesome things going on. Um, it's just that there is a lot of momentum to Angular, uh, and it has a lot of momentum for a reason. Um, so that's, I guess, my social proof <laughs> area of that. Um, before, uh, the, my last bit on Angular, um, in a very weird way, has to do with the death and demise of the blink tag. Uh, argue, who remembers the blink tag? You all remember the blink tag. I think it only worked in like uh, Firefox, right? We, we didn't have it in Internet Explorer. We didn't have it in uh, any WebKit uh, browsers, that type of thing. And that's their loss, really, uh, because Blink was sort of a, a pinnacle of human achievement, right? It was, <laughs> it was a great way to call attention uh, to, to any aspect of any element on a page uh, and, and you know, maybe annoy people a little bit at the same time. And you, know, you can still get that in other ways these days, but Blink, uh, you know, we miss you, sort of. <laughs> um, and so I'm not going to bring back Blink. You can bring back Blink with Angular. You can make your own Blink tag. Um, and it's the 21st century. We've, we've moved on from that. Um, there are better things that we can do. And so I'd like to introduce the Morse tag. Um, and uh, this, is, this is touching on something in Angular called a directive. Um, and I promise this is all tying right back into Ionic. Let me pull up my slides on here quick. Um, so what do we want the Morse tag to do? We want it to behave sort of like the blink tag, right? But the blink tag was just very, very like this. We want something like, I don't know, something a little more wild, something you know, maybe, maybe if you have a hard time reading normal words and you're better at Morse code, we want it to blink at you in Morse code. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, maybe it's another avenue for accessibility. I don't know. Um, but inside this Morse tag, it's going to work exactly like the blink tag, um, only it's called Morse. And whatever you put inside of it is going to blink in the Morse code pattern of whatever you have put inside. And so, uh, we can make that with an Angular directive, and directives are awesome. Uh, and let's look at Morris's code. That's marked it as a pun for you. <laughs> so let me just hop in, and maybe it's not the most beautiful code, but it gets the job done. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, wow, that's awful. Let me make that a lot bigger. White background? Oh, wow. I don't even. <laughs> Actually, this is Adam. I could look at making an extension that, <laughs> that could do that. Um, can you kind of see it now? Adam has a light theme. Yeah. Adam has a light theme. All right, let me. Uh, let's see, where are we? Themes. Oh, Adam Light. That, I think that's it right there. Oh, no, that's the UI theme. Sorry, everyone. Oh my, okay. Let it switch. How's that? Oh, there we go. So much better. Thank you for the applause. Who, who applauded? <laughs> you guys did? You get, some, someone gets a Pop-Tart. <laughs> All right. I need to start getting rid of them, so speak up. <laughs> um, and so I'm actually using Browserify to sort of make this into a module, kind of my first dive into it, um, because I wanted to be a, a little bit lazier here and include things like async and lodash uh, and jQuery just to get the job done faster and in less code. Um, and I, I love I love all of those libraries, too. Um, and so we start off with a character map, um, A through Z. Um, all the way down to 0 through 9. Um, and essentially, all they are are arrays. A should blink for one unit of blink. I don't know. I, I should have picked better words. Um, and then three. So it would be like beep, beep, right? Something like that. What's that? Yeah, a long dash. There it is. Um, and so, you know, some characters, you know, characters are composed of those short and long dashes. Or is it a dot? I don't know. What's that? 
dot dash. OK, maybe I should have researched this first. <laughs> um, I know, right? <laughs> Um, and so in between characters, um, and wow, I actually have to check the code for it. Um, I believe we actually have three, three units of time uh, that we do not do anything. Um, in between words, we have seven units of time, right? And so I have this character map where I can essentially turn words into arrays of arrays, and I can turn paragraphs into arrays of arrays of arrays. Um, and it's, it's very confusing to look at, but it, it works, so that's, that's, that's good. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me pop on down here. Um, we generate the code, so that makes my arrays of arrays of arrays, and I won't walk through that because it's horrifying. Um, we generate the timing, so uh, I take those and I create essentially a flat array of objects, right? Um, you should beep for this many units of time. Um, you should then not beep for this many units of time. And the combination of all of those gives us Morse code. Um, and so what I'm doing here is defining the Morse Angular module. Um, and I'm creating a directive called Morse, right? Adam is really hard to scroll sideways. Um, and I'm popping in interval, which is an Angular service. Um, I'm restricting to E, which means it's going to be an element. I can also do things like uh, restrict it to an attribute, uh, maybe a comment. Um, but you know, really, in the spirit of Blink, we're going to make it a full-blown element. right? Um, I'm able to pass in additional attributes to this. Um, if I don't want that inside text to be the thing that's blinking, uh, if I want to kind of get my text from somewhere else, I can pop that into an attribute, which is input text. Um, and essentially what Blink is going to do is change the class of the element, or change the class of, did I say Blink? <laughs> change the class of its element um, back and forth from uh, an on class to an off class. Beat basis, um, you may have heard me say, you know, we Blink for three units of time, then one, then three, yada yada. Um, how fast do we actually want that to go? So it's essentially a multiplier in milliseconds for that. Um, and so ch -ch -ch, here's some other stuff that's going on. I'm not going to get too far into it. Um, you know, we're handling in our in our linking function sort of the style switching, um, watching for changes to input text and changes to the actual text of the element that is going to be blinking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, in the controller. We have the ability to execute beeps, um, kind of go asynchronously through the entire collection of beeps and execute them one at a time. Um, and there's not really a reason to run in that because it has really nothing too much to do. But the point is, we can make our very own uh, HTML element. So let me make this bigger. And so I can change my basis right up top. Um, this is, and actually I should probably dive into the code a little bit. Oh, this is all so small. Um, let me pop in. Sorry guys. Index. Okay. So uh, in the actual document, this is just to get it set up real quick, uh, we are requiring Angular. I've got my bundle.js right in there, um, which is registering everything good to go. Um, ng app is going to be Morse. Um, I have my beep off and my beep box on styles, um, and so I'm, I, I, I want to put it in a box instead. You know, I don't necessarily want just the text to blink. Um, and so I've got a range input, uh, minimum 25, max 500. These are milliseconds. Um, I'm binding it to ng model basis. Uh, we've got a text area where I can actually type in a phrase. Um, you know, make it kind of monospace, I don't know. Maybe that's unnecessary. Uh, and we are, there we go. And then we actually have the, the Morse tag, right? So in the Morse tag, I can define my on class. So when the beep is on, I want uh, the beep box on class to be applied. When it is off, I want, you know, what will be defaulting to um, the, the beep off class to be applied. Uh, input text. Uh, I can use my little curly braces to pop in phrase, which 
Uh, if you remember from eight seconds ago, uh, we have ng model phrase up here in text area. And then uh, beat basis, uh, which is uh, from this range slider, lets me kind of control the speed. So let's not do that. And there we have it. So hello, my name is Josh. So we're, we're kind of going through, this is our Morris code. You know, if, you, if you're a fast reader, I'm a pretty fast reader, maybe this is better for you. Um, if you're really fast, maybe that's a seizure thing, I don't know, I should probably make it slower. So it, look away, that, that's probably the only, you know, yeah, thing you maybe have to look out for there. But the point is, uh, this, was, this was kind of something reserved originally for the Greek gods, right? To be able to just on the fly create your own uh, HTML element, to extend HTML and bend it to your will. Um, and so we've made the Morse tag here. Um, and that's, that's pretty cool, I think. Um, and that's, that would be great. That would, that's, that's fantastic. We'll open source this, get some pull requests going. Um, you know, maybe we can record our voices and beep, you know, something, something like that. Uh, and, and it would be great. And I actually have kind of different ways of representing the beep coming up when we make this into an app. <laughs> um, so uh, again, directives are awesome. Let's clap. That was, that was, that was good, right? Okay. <laughs> So like I said, this, this needs an app, right? Um, which uh, let's, we, we, we need to figure out a way to ship it, right? Because this is, this is a billion dollar idea. I have no doubt about this. Um, you know, we're, we're on the fast track to, to some sort of acquisition here. Um, we just need to get it in the hands of teens and they're, they're using their mobile phones. So um, my business sense tells me that this is the way that we need to go. So we are going to use something called the Ionic framework in combination with Apache Cordova. You can use Ionic with other things too, by the way. Um, PhoneGap, um, I think Trigger.io is another one, um, if I'm getting that right. Um, but that's what we want to do. Um, and so to make this into an app, we need something called node.js. Has anybody heard of, of node? Only a few of you, okay. Yeah, it's not, it's, uh, it's fairly obscure at this point. Um, but uh, if you actually wanna put it on a phone, um, there's not gonna be a lot of being, stuff being put on a phone because the build process and stuff can kind of take a little while. We've got pizza coming in, so I'm gonna wrap the, kind of this little section up and then we can go do that. Um, but uh, you know, if you want to put it on a phone, you either need Xcode, pay $99 a year for an iOS developer license, um, which is what I did, um, or you can get the Android SDK, put it on there for free and very quick and easy. Um, from there on out, it's just uh, installing modules through NPM, right? So we're gonna do a global install of Ionic, Cordova, and iOS Sim, um, and that'll, that'll get us to where we want to be. So to start a new project, we can say ionic start um, morse, which is the name of the project, and blank, because we want a blank template. Um, there's other types of projects that we can start as well, um, but we're gonna start with blank, because um, we're gonna build from the ground up. We'll pop into morse, um, and because I wanna emulate on iOS, um, I'm going, you, you, can add, you can add different platforms, right? So all I'm gonna add at this point, you can, I'll leave Android to the reader. Um, we'll, we'll add iOS as a platform. We can then build iOS, and then we can emulate iOS. And so let's do that right now. Oh man, that is small, okay. Okay, so okay, so what were my instructions? Let me go back. <laughs> okay, so we've got Ionic build iOS and Ionic emulate iOS. And so we're gonna let it do that. There's, there's a better way that we're, we're gonna be able to do this where we aren't gonna have to wait, you know, maybe 30 seconds for things to boot up and different things like that because, you know, this is a fast-paced, you know, pedal to the metal talk. <sighs> and there we have it. And then we, then we let the iOS simulator start up, so it's kind of running a, a virtual version of iOS 7. And we look at the black screen for a little bit. 
Don't worry, we're only doing this one more time. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have to double check on that. Um, OK, so there we have it. That, that is all there is to it. That is the blank starter Ionic app. Um, let me just uh, do a really quick run through um, of, I guess, what it's giving you by default uh, as, a, as a project tree. You've got a readme. Uh, anybody use Bower at all to manage front end dependencies? So you've got uh, Bower JSON. Um, you've got a config.xml um, gulp file. So they're using gulp, which is fantastic. Um, I'm just going to kind of skip on down a little bit here. Um, our package JSON, um, when I added iOS as a platform, that got put under platforms. Plugins we're going to talk about in a little while, so I'm going to skip that. Um, uh, Ionic, the, the styling is based on uh, SAS, um, or SCSS being the dialect that they're using. And under www is where you're going to actually put your app. Um, and right now, we are our pizza is here. I would like to have a slice of pizza. And so we're going to break for a little bit, have some pizza. Uh, and then we're going to come back. We are going to make Morse into an app. Sounds good? All right. All right. This is a nice intermission. Got a little pizza. I am disappointed, though, because not, not one of you came up and asked for a Pop-Tart. So <laughs> yes, yes, you can. Here you go. Thank you. Anybody else want one? You don't even have to ask a question. One more, I'll give out. Yeah? Oh. OK. Here, I'll give you. You can throw it. You can throw it? All right. There you go. OK. <clears throat> so now that I've gotten rid of some Pop Tarts, I've still got three left, or six if you think about it that way. Um, three packs, two packs. Um, anyway, uh, where were we? So we, uh, we just created a new blank um, Ionic project from the blank template, right? Um, and so I demoed that, I believe, right? And I need to catch up here. So here we have the Ionic blank starter. Let me see if I can make that any bigger. Now it's on an iPad, apparently. just the way it displays the red iPhone when the Chrome won't fit on your screen. Ah, OK. All right. Well, either way, it's on an iPad now. <laughs> But uh, you know that's that's not the worst thing in the world, right? Um, so all it says is Ionic blank starter, and <laughs> what is Ionic, right? I haven't even really talked about that yet. Um, but I'm going to leave you in suspense for just a little bit longer. Um, so you, we have a few different options for development. You remember how long that took? You know, I did my Ionic build iOS and Ionic emulate iOS and. That got a little bit tedious. Um, we had to wait for everything to go up and go up there. And if you're like me, every time you go to maybe your browser while you're developing, there's a bug that you need to fix. Because um, I'm human, and that's just how I develop. Uh, our second option is, is my personal favorite, um, which is Ionic Serve. And so let me bounce over to my terminal. And the one that I'm wanting to use is actually coloring white. But maybe if I make it just really, really large. Um, but all I'm typing here is ionic serve. And uh, there it is. Oh, shoot. Let me open up my web inspector here. And uh, in, in Chrome, in your web inspector, you can actually emulate um, an iOS app, um, or in this case, Apple iPhone 5. So, um, you kind of have, instead of a mouse pointer, a little circle-y thing, which is maybe your fingertip. Um, and there it is. That's, that's all that it really is. And so I can go in, and let me see if I can change a few things in here. Can you still hear me? Is it? Maybe I need to button up more. Um, and so here we are in a net, and maybe I go in, um, remember, under www is where our app is that we're building it. Um, let me see if I pop into index.html, um, ionic blank starter. Let me just call this Morse, right? And let me pop up. Oh, there it is, right there. So it's, it's watching, and we're back in Chrome now. Um, I didn't need to go back to the terminal. I didn't need to do any of that. Um, it, it, it live updated, essentially. Um, so 
That is fantastic. That's a lot faster than waiting to build your app and then run it through the emulator. Um, when you start to do some of the more native functionality types of things, I mean, Chrome, as far as I know, isn't able to make your laptop vibrate or anything like that. As far as I know, there's, there's not really an API for that yet. Um, maybe down the line, we'll see. Um, but uh, for now, for the bulk of what I'm talking about today, which is kind of these UI components and that type of thing, the browser is, is the perfect place for that. Yeah? Oh, right down here. So when you're, when you're in developer tools, and this is all very, anyway, oh, there we go. Yep, standard developer tool, all you have to do is hit escape. And you get like this extra thingy down here, um, and you can pick your device. So we can also, and maybe this is a good thing to cover too, um, it's essentially screen size and maybe like user agent too. I'm not really sure about that part. Um, but on a Nexus 10, I can select that and emulate it, and it looks different, right? Um, iPhone 4, if I want kind of the you know, non-longer version, there's that. I have an iPhone 5, so I like to see it you know, in that same resolution. So good, thank you for that question. Would you like a Pop-Tart? No? OK. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to get rid of these. I thought, that, I thought it was a great idea, but apparently <laughs> not. <laughs> You're trying to quit, OK. <laughs> you want one? Here, here you go. Yeah, I'll throw one. There you go. All right. I know, right? I, I put a picture of raspberry, and then I, I brought strawberry, and that was, that was wrong of me, and I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so, so there's that. But that was, that was a very good question, because how do you emulate, right? And that's a good trick. You just open up the developer console, hit escape. At the bottom, you've got that emulation tab. Um, and so there's that. And then you can also send it directly to your device, which um, I think it's probably going to take a little longer than the first one, but if you really want to try it in its actual environment, you can go ahead and do that. Um, and I'm not going to do that right now because, you know, I don't have time. Um, and so let's add in morse.js. And instead of fumbling around trying to live code, I have another folder with the same project but with morse inside. So smart. <laughs> OK, so there we are here. Um, and all I'm going to do, since I'm in this new folder, that's not how you spell Ionic. It's Ionic serve. And here we are. It's kind of weird first entering the developer console because I kind of need to refresh. But uh, this, all that it is, is the tag as I originally described. It is the Morse tag with some text inside, maybe a little styling. Um, and it is blinking, as we would expect, in Morse code. Um, and so there's that aspect. And if I had to guess, it says it's probably CSS, um, what are they called? CSS transition. Yes, yes. Absolutely. And actually, let me, uh, I can pop that open real quick. Um, so we were in 0, 01 in it, 0, 02 add Morse. Um, so if we pop into CSS real quick, um, you know, I'm just kind of aligning the tag, making the width nice, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I have a beep off and a beep on. Um, I'm changing the opacity instead of setting like display none because if I have other stuff on the page, they're going to move around whenever it blinks and all of that. So I just added a 0.2 second transition, uh, you know, kind of make it a little prettier. Um, and so that's really all we had to do to add Morse.js. Um, we look at the index.html. Um, uh, let's see, in, and let's just kind of break down what is actually in this project, which is probably a good idea. Um, so if we hop into JS, um, or let's hop into to this first, uh, we have uh, kind of our Ionic dependencies, we've got our Cordova dependencies, um, and then we've got app.js, and I've also included morse.js, which is just the browserified bundle uh, that I created, um, which, you, which you saw earlier. So hopping into app.js, um, we're creating an Angular module called Starter, because it's still just the starter app. In fact, I don't think I've ever changed that in this entire demo, um, which we are pulling in as dependencies to make available elsewhere in our app, Ionic um, and Morse. 
Um, and then, so this is just kind of the standard Ionic platform running of things and, and whatnot. Uh, and then we pop into Morse. This is the, this is all browserified and whatnot and quite long and, and all that stuff. Um, and so that's, that's really all that there was to it. Um, I, didn't, I, I didn't have to do anything else. All I had to do is copy those in, change a couple lines, and I have a Morse code app. You had a question? Uh, Mm -hmm. Require in in where? Like the syntax is very much like require. Oh, in Morse. Yeah, that's that's from Browserify. So like, if you look at this, this is like Morse.js is kind of the same file I was showing you before with some uh, some crazy stuff at the front. And then when we go past the bottom, um, you know, where it, it has our dependencies, that type of thing. So um, it's it's all it's all a Browserify bundle. So. Require it would also be available inside of the app, but the way that I actually made the bundle, I don't need to require it anywhere. It's just pulling in an Angular and, and adding it as a module. Any other questions before I continue on? No? OK. Now, what is this Ionic thing that I keep talking about? Um, I, I was at NGConf in Salt Lake City in January. Uh, one of the very first presentations was on something called the Ionic Framework. Uh, and it promised a way to, using AngularJS, uh, create hybrid mobile apps that are very beautiful and very performant. Um, and I was so blown away that I actually emailed the very next day uh, wanting to talk about it. Um, because I knew that this was something that, uh, you know, at work we've got, uh, our main app is, is based on Angular. Uh, we're looking to do mobile. We've been looking at prototyping, uh, lots of different stuff for it. Uh, and Ionic, uh, just the way that it's been evolving over the last several months, I believe the project started uh, summer 2013. Um, so it's, it's relatively new at this point yet still. Um, but it's really exciting stuff. What's that? Yes, it is still beta. I, they're getting really, really, really close to a release, though. It's like 1.0.0-beta-something or another. So <laughs> um, I, I think it's their goal to actually release a full 1.0 very soon. But uh, what is Ionic exactly? It's CSS and Angular directives. That's the simplest way uh, that I can put it. And we've seen how powerful directives can be in, in you know, resurrecting the blink tag into something revolutionary and new, um, world changing, um, you know, creating our own elements that uh, you know, let us do a lot very quickly. Um, so let's just kind of break down maybe what's going on um, with some of the different ionic elements uh, that you saw in when I actually made Morse into an app, right? So, if you were to look at the HTML, you would see ion pane. Notice this isn't a standard HTML element. Um, it, it has its own behavior, and I kind of have from the docs type of thing. Um, and a, a lot of them are, can either be styles only um, or styles with added functionality like a full-blown directive, right? Um, ion header, uh, who, who, who's used Bootstrap before? Right? This reminds me a lot of, of Bootstrap. Um, only a lot of interactivity also added in for um, you know, really delivering a, a phenomenal mobile experience, right? So this is kind of like Bootstrap's nav bar sort of to a sense, right? Um, and so you've got the ion header bar, which gives me a nice little header at the top there. Ion content uh, has uh, some additional styling available. Let me see if I can pull up the emulation in the browser. Actually, I have to refresh to get my animation going again. But notice I can, I can kind of do my scrolly thing. Um, and so Ionic content lets me create an area where I can scroll through and whatnot. And let's see. <coughs> Let me move down one, sorry. Um, so let's, let's take a real quick visit to the Ionic docs. Um, Give kind of, get kind of like a whirlwind tour of what they have available um, in terms of styling and directives. Um, so if we hop on in, I'm just going to run through styling really quick. So um, as we saw before, um, we've got, uh, and this is just styles, not quite functionality yet. 
Um, but you can define different header bars given your class. You've got all sorts of different colors available. I really like the names they give, like assertive and energized. It's very, it's very lively. <laughs> Balanced, kind of zen, calm. It's, it, it's great. Um, <clears throat> you know, subheaders, slightly different styling there. Um, you know, you've got uh, your content areas. Uh, footers available, and, and this is great, right? You can scroll, you can see exactly um, you know, how it will look in your app going down the side. Um, your different button stylings, um, and, and you'll notice that all of this is very iOS-y, right? Um, and I wanna stress that you can also build Android apps for this. Um, iOS, I think, is kind of what, what I imagine is its first starting point. Android is obviously a very, very big market, and as we mentioned before, Ionic is making its way to 1.0, so I would not be surprised whatsoever to see um, you know, more Android styling options down the line, too. So don't let that, uh, don't let that deter you, necessarily, um, you know, if, you're, if you're more of an Android user. Um, block buttons, um, small and large, outlined. Um, clear um, icon buttons. Uh, Ionic actually also has its own icon library uh, called Ionicons. And so this provides, and let me make this much bigger. Um, anybody out there use like Font Awesome or anything like that? Um, and so this is an icon font um, specifically for mobile apps. And there's a lot of them. I was actually very surprised to see how many there were. Um, you know, little spinny ones, um, little houses, you know, the works, right? <clears throat> paper airplanes, you gotta have a paper airplane. Um, a car, you know, all, all those sort of things. So there's, there's a lot of different options. Xbox, if you're making an Xbox app, um, you know. Point is, there's options. Um, and, and this is kind of one component of the whole thing, is making sure that you have good icons to use in your app. Um, because screen real estate is limited. You need good icons, maybe not necessarily big words. <clears throat> Are they What's that? Are they yeah, you can style them however you'd like. I mean, it's, it's, think of it like as a font, right? So you can change it to whatever color you'd, you'd want it to be. Like if you wanted to use Font Awesome too? Yeah. Yeah, like, well, uh, and I, I don't think that they're really going to be incompatible too, because like with Font Awesome, everything is prefixed. And let me just check in the docs for this. I would imagine that these. I guess it sounds yeah. a little bit like, I guess in your examples, I, I seen it, that it's like you might end up with an Angular directive that generates a certain style, and you mm -hmm. have Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know if any, if any icons are going to kind of just appear because you've used a directive, which I'll be getting into those directives in a minute, too. Um, you know, you can add them in where appropriate. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm, I'm not sure, we have to look more into that. Uh, let's see here. And so just to real quick kind of wrap this up, um, you know, clear buttons and headers, I mean, there, there are so many UI concepts available on mobile, right? Um, and they're really trying to get all the bases covered. So different, you know, scrollable lists. I don't think I can actually scroll in this yet. So that'll come more in the directives. Um, you know, list dividers, um, icons within lists, and you're already kind of seeing that, I mean, this, this feels much closer to native than really any sort of UI library that I've seen for mobile before, at least in terms of, of the world of iOS, I guess, right? Um, buttons within your lists, I mean, avatars, thumbnails, um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, you know, different cards. Um, you, you, uh, my, my point is there is, there is so much, um, you know, you've got your little toggles, different things like that. Um, 
And uh, the, a lot of this will include animations, um, different things to, to make this feel as native as possible, nearly native, if you will. Um, and so you know, you've got your basic checkboxes. Uh, I used a range slider to, to pick the rate of my Morse code, uh, different things like that. Um, select, which when you click on it in Chrome, it's, it's not going to look like it would in iOS. You kind of have a little thing that pop up. Um, my browser is way too little because I have an 11 inch screen to show tabs properly, but you can have tabs, you can have icon only tabs, um, depending on how you want to style stuff, right? Um, uh, there's a grid system, um, all those sort of things, and I can sort of make my way down to the bottom. Um, yeah, and again, here's ion icons. So icon class, icon ion star. Um, I know that um, font awesome, for instance, the syntax is going to be similar yet different. It's like namespaced on its own. So if you wanted to mix and match, I imagine that you could. Um, and then some utility stuff. <clears throat> but this is the part that, oh, sorry. Uh, I don't know if there's any um, dragon um, we're, we're actually getting to the interactivity right now. Um, we can kind of look through, through some of these, but that was, that was more so for the styling aspect. Um, now we're actually going to be diving into the part that really excited me um, is, they, they call it AngularJS extensions in the docs, um, directives if you will, I suppose. Um, but uh, we just kind of hop on in and the, f the very first one, let's take a look at tabs, right? Um, so clicking between I mean, I guess there's nothing too much on those pages, but all that this really is, notice in this piece of documentation, I really don't see any JavaScript. I see ion tabs as an element. You assign the classes for the stylings that you want. Um, for the actual tab itself, it's an ion tab element, um, and you add in ion tabs. You give it a title. Um, you can give it an icon. Um, and, and, and all of those different things. It's fantastic. Um, and then again, kind of going down into the actual tab, uh, you've got you know, your title, all that stuff, and we actually just popped into there. Um, we've got uh, slide menus, right? So you see these a lot on you know, maybe your Facebook app, different things like that, um, all sort of built in and ready for you to use in directive format. Uh, Let's just pop through a couple more of these. Let's see what was good. So, does that allow you to slide from the side or only click on the Um, I would have to actually launch this in native to see. But yeah, if you if you were to click and drag with with your thumb, it might only be in that top part. I think in testing, I've seen it in other places on the screen too, though. Um, Let's see, you know, you've got your different lists that you can, you know, do your clicking and dragging and sort of scrolling through. You've got that momentum aspect to it. Um, just another thing that you don't need to code up yourself from scratch. It's all in a directive, right? Um, and notice it's all that none of these docs, um, uh, the usage is all HTML because it is all directives because they are that powerful. <coughs> Form inputs, um, you know, you've got your checkboxes, that type of thing. So this is all of this is really adding interactivity to those style pages that we just saw. Um, let's pop into things like modal. Actually, I don't think I can do a preview of this on here. No, that's too bad. Um, but uh, action sheets, so. You know, the little, uh, little pop-ups at the bottom, if you, are you sure you want to delete something, modify, whatever. Um, there, there are just so many things that are part of, I guess, that native experience that you would get when you are writing the app natively. It, there are things that come, um, you know, with the SDK uh, that Ionic is finally providing to, to folks like me who are using primarily web technologies. Um, and so that's, that, that's what was so exciting to me about uh, seeing the Ionic presentation at ng-conf. Um, just being able to take Angular, which I use every day um, and have experienced the power of firsthand constantly, uh, and, and be able to apply it to a domain that 
you know, was otherwise, unless I were to muster up the time to learn Objective-C, different things like that, um, was, was somewhat more inaccessible, right? And so let's, uh, and actually I kind of jumped the gun. So um, let's, let's add a little bit of ionic magic to this, um, starting with uh, the beat basis. Um, and so I am actually going to pop into Morris 3 in here. So I'm essentially extending this a little bit more, right? Um, so I've got my text area still um, where I'm storing the phrase. And then I've got the range class, which is provided to us by the ionic docs. Um, I'm supplying an input of type range. I want it to go from 25 to 500. Um, and I want it to bind to basis. Uh, and again, like we saw with that first demo without actually doing mobile stuff, uh, we just plop that right back into the Morse tag. Uh, and we have an ion class. Um, the next thing I want to do, um, which is a little more fun, I think, is change how the blinking looks. So instead of having words blink, I either want a blue box or I want to see a picture of Rob Lowe. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, that, that's uh, it, it's a little more fun to me. It's, it's how I prefer to uh, consume my Morris code personally. Um, but, you know, to each their own. And so, there we have that. Let's see how, and, and keep in mind, this was just editing the HTML, right? Uh, if I go into my app.js, it looks exactly the same as it did before. Uh, if I pop into morris.js, it is, of course, exactly as it was before. And let me pop in. And Ionic, whoa. Okay, I got my live reload server up. This is weird. I am, I'm always needing to refresh here. Uh, shoot. Okay, so let me, let me reset this. Let me switch to Rob Lowe. And keep in mind, since we're in the browser, um, this is a little trickier um, in, in terms of you, you aren't going to actually see the uh, select box styling there. But uh, howdy. Um, there he goes. It's hard to see him, so I'm going to slow it down a little bit. And, and there he goes. He, uh, Rob Lowe saying howdy to me, of all people, um, literally. And so there he goes. And so I, I, I can consume Morse code in whichever way is pleasing to me. Um, the boring route, um, you could argue, is switching to the blue box. And so howdy, how are you? There goes my blue box, uh, and I'm able to do what I want to do to make it fast. You know, you can read Morse code that fast. Good for you, um, <laughs> or slow. Um, and so that gives me a little bit more interactivity, uh, kind of using the baked-in ionic uh, elements. And I am, I am a, I'm, I'm not that great of a designer, you know, I admit. Um, but that that look that certainly looks better than, uh, you know, my original here, which kind of had this going for it and all of that stuff. So um, let's take a look. Uh, and, I, and I told you I would run the emulator uh, exactly one more time. Um, and I'm going to show you not an app that I made, but an app that the Ionic folks made uh, to show off uh, what they're doing. Um, and so Ionic. Uh, build iOS and Ionic emulate iOS. So I'm going to build and emulate their weather app. Um, and so it, it's uh, it's sort of based on Yahoo Weather's you know very pretty um, you know weather with thin text and flatness and all of that sort of thing. Um, other adjectives to fill in the time while it builds. Um, and so the build has succeeded. Uh, and I will allow weather to do its thing. And so um, they are better designers than I am, I, I suppose. Um, but uh, it looks like it is 64 degrees and clear in San Francisco, California. Um, and let me pop in. And I can scroll on down. 
And here's my forecast for the week. Is anybody going to San Francisco this week? Nobody's going to San Francisco this week. Okay. Well, if you were, uh, this would be your forecast. And I don't know. It's it's kind of a good demo of you know how how pretty you can actually make an app with you know the Ionic components and things that come right out of the box. And of course, a little of custom styling of your own. Yep. Uh, so is the framework uh, provide anything that you can access from natively, or uh, we are still relying on the uh, Cordova to access, let's say, the CPS? Um, yes, and I'm going to get to like kind of those native functionalities in a minute too. Um, and so essentially, this asked the emulator if I wanted to give it my location, and I said yes. Um, and so. I think you actually can get that browser side too, but there's things like vibration, other things like that, that you really need to be able to hook up to the native APIs for. Um, and so I'm going to be getting into that in just a minute. OK, let me see where I am in my talk. Mm -hmm. Interactive application, but is it a design to run on desktop as well? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I Ionic styling is very much geared toward mobile itself. I mean, there's responsive in the sense that you know, right? It's on. It's on an iPad right now, but you know you, it, it, it adapts to different screen sizes of different devices. Um, but uh, it's and, and kind of like I mentioned at the beginning, right? The the things that you need to consider when designing a desktop app versus designing a mobile app um, tend to be somewhat different. Just being responsive isn't quite enough, I don't think. Um, you know, just because you're responsive doesn't mean it's going to be a great mobile experience. Normally, that kind of takes the back burner to whatever desktop app you're writing. Um, and so in terms of kind of a, a tool that does it all, um, I, I, I don't have an answer for that at this I point. Mean, so, so a tool that does it all, I mean, good point that the interface is going to want to look the same. Mm -hmm. What we get into is if it wants to look different, how do you reuse code? Sure. But you do need one framework mm -hmm. that does it all by letting you tell it to oh, yeah. be the same and what's different. Absolutely. And I would say that that framework is Angular. Um, you can certainly reuse, like you know, your Angular services and and all of that. Yeah, and uh, the 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 routing, I believe, on on the Ionic end is is just using like UI router. You're defining states in the same way that you would define states in like a desktop web app. If you want it to be a desktop app in its own shell, there's plenty of shells where you can run like web content natively into. Um, and so, in terms of code reuse. If you can write your app in such a modular way that you know, most of your important non-presentational stuff is sort of tucked away on the Angular end in nice, pretty, neat modules, and you, you know, can rewrite the, the actual presentation layer uh, for desktop, there, I'm, there's a ton of code reuse possible there, I think. So, which is why I find Angular so awesome. Um, and I showed you the beep classes. Rob Lowe was kind of the, the finishing touch there. Um, uh, let's talk about Cordova. We, we had a question about you know, connecting to the native stuff, right? So the only difference that we've really seen so far in packaging up a hybrid app um, is really the fact that you can sell it in the App Store, right? There are so many native phone functions uh, that we're going to want to tap into ultimately. and so. Cordova, what is it? Um, and I'm not going to go to the website, but um, if you wanted to go in and check it out more, uh, you can go to cordova.apache.org. Um, and it's essentially what lets us, it gives us our native shell to run on other devices, um, and it gives us a web view to run our app inside of. Um, there are plenty of plugins for Cordova, which I'm going to get into that in just a minute. Um, that let you actually tap in to some of the native functionality using JavaScript APIs, right? And so, announced and uh, you know first version released last Tuesday of all days. I'm I'm glad it wasn't this Tuesday because this is this is a fantastic 
um, new addition to the Ionic family for my talk um, is something called ng Cordova, right? So, like I said, Cordova gives you JavaScript based APIs that connect to the native APIs that you can use just right in your app. ng Cordova gives you Angular wrappers um, so that you can access native functionality uh, in a very Angular ish way, right? And so, Tagline is AngularJS extensions on top of the Cordova API. And uh, let's pop in there and uh, see how this all kind of pulls together. So just like we required Morse and just like we required Ionic, we can bring in ng Cordova under our app, right? Um, we can put Cordova in a script tag right above. It needs to be above Cordova.js. Um, and we can kind of take it from there. Um, if I wanted to add in like a barcode scanner, right? You can add, uh, where's my command line? Like if I wanted to add a barcode scanner to Ionic Weather, I'm not gonna implement it right now because I don't have an hour. Um, we can go to the plugin, add that. And it's downloading and fetching uh, and it will be available for us um, to use once we continue to do stuff here. So we've got a barcode scanner, we've got camera plugins, we've got plugins to connect to your contacts, devices, um, you know, get basic device information, um, tracking motion through the accelerometer, um, checking what your device orientation is, um, all sorts of different things like that. Um, even popping in Google Analytics, geolocation, globalization, um, all sorts of different things, checking your network connection, uh, push notifications, social sharing, uh, so many different things, modifying your splash screen, um, all sorts of different things. So let's just take a look at how these sort of integrate in a very Angular-ish way, right? And you kind of have to have, be forming an appreciation of Angular in order to really freak out over this like, like I did when I was first introduced to it. <laughs> um, but uh, this is, for example, how you would integrate a barcode scanner. Oh, you had a question? Mm -hmm. changed. Um, I believe Cordova is now a global NPM module. Is that some Ionic? Uh, I, the, it's a dependency of Ionic when I did NPM install, and of course there's so many that I can't really do it, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it is, it is a, a globally available NPM module at this point. Um, and so in being required by Ionic, it is also available for use there. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, Like we did before, you can, and you, you remember our good old friend scope, um, we can define a function on the scope called scan barcode. So let's say you have a button, you can use the ng click directive and say, okay, when I click on this button, I want you to scan a barcode. Um, and so in doing this, uh, notice we've used dependency injection. Um, and if you wanna know more about dependency injection, Again, this isn't an Angular talk, but you can, you can check out the Angular docs for that type of thing. Suffice to say, declaring it here makes it available down here. Um, so Cordova, barcode scanner, we scan. Uh, and then once the scanning has completed, we can take the image da data, do stuff with it, or handle errors as they occur. Um, it's, it's very similar with the camera function. So you inject Cordova camera. That's all you have to do. Um, you can define a function on the scope, which you can bind to a button, scope take picture, um, and a Cordova camera dot get picture. And you end up with um, you know, your image data and then you can manipulate it from there. Um, yeah, so the, these, are, these are the most, uh, wait, are these what? When you say go back to the previous slide. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, these are just standard promises. Yep, 
Um, and promises are kind of the preferred thing to do in Angular. Um, and so uh, there's manipulation of contacts. Um, you know, you have access to the device that's currently running. So um, you know, you can check out the model, the platform, UUID version, all of that stuff. Um, this is kind of cool, Cordova device motion. Um, and so uh, you can do get acceleration, which will get the current acceleration. I believe on iOS, it will only get the last watch acceleration. It's a weird edge thing. But you can also watch acceleration. So whenever, you know, every three seconds, you can check to see what your current acceleration is, that type of thing. Um, checking device orientation. Uh, again, like the common theme to all of these is you inject your dependency into whatever controller you're using, and it's available for you to use. And it's incredibly straightforward, and it's a very, very uniform style of doing it. Um, and that's essentially how we connect to, let me see if I can find geolocation. So again, here's geolocation. Just uh, declare Cordova geolocation as a dependency. It's available within your controller. You can define a function on your scope, bind it to a button or whatever you want to do with it, um, and then call get current position. You get a promise back, which contains your uh, current position, provided that you, know, you have proper permissions and whatnot. So there we are, connecting with uh, the native APIs. All right, and that, uh, that, that's kind of our whirlwind tour of modern tools that bring hybrid apps to a nearly native state. Yes? Um, when you include, say, like a, uh, a plugin for contacts, mm -hmm. and you go to push that to a app store, mm -hmm. do you have to then specify that permission in your? Yes. I need to. Well, I've been told that since you're building the app using the Cordova tool chain, Mm -hmm. Talking to Cordova, that it, so you're, you're thinking Android, it, as soon as you're covering permissions, you're talking Android, mm -hmm. as opposed to iOS, and you just have to click OK. You only mm -hmm. have the permission that's specific. Well, how about like, when you download that and tell, and tell the other well, yeah, one that, that, all these things? Right, it's all in one place. That's right. only but, in one place. But am I going to be Android or, or is like, there a standard place where the app store is scanning to see what yes, permissions are required and then puts that up on the screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can. I can Mm -hmm. you actually have to declare, uh, mm -hmm. but, but Cordova, I'm sure, will do that for you. Yeah, and, there's the, yeah, I'm, and I'm, I'm fairly certain there's a standard, like, you check the Cordova docs, there's a standard place to, um, like, when it, when it first booted up the, the weather app, there was a dialogue popping up asking if it could use my location. Um, and we'd have to take a, a look around in there, but uh, I'm fairly certain there's a standard place where you declare that, um, that Cordova uses it. Okay. Call the API function, and if the user, if any app can call it, and if the user hasn't given that mm -hmm. app permission, it pauses your app. Just okay. Pause and shows that dialog, and then when the user clicks OK, you're back as if the function had just worked mm -hmm. immediately. Perfect. On Android, you declare it, and then it just always works. Mm -hmm. Or if you don't declare it, your app crashes. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. Would you like a pop tart? I think I asked you that at the beginning, yeah. and you didn't want a pop tart. I've got, I've got two left. It was still there. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, any any other questions that you have about Ionic in general? Yeah. Having never written a mobile app, mm -hmm. this could be a silly question, but as a web developer, I'm so used to step one before you release the stuff to production is minifying all of this code. Mm -hmm. Is there any minification to the release of this JavaScript? Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, right, when, you, when you're serving up a web page, the time that it takes to transmit you know, your JavaScript files down is very important for the performance of the page. Um, I haven't really seen so much in recommendations for or minification of your code uh, at this point, just because I'm sure with like, all of the binaries that are included when it's actually packaged up as an app, the amount of JavaScript code that you're including is probably pretty negligible in, in making a difference there. I mean, you can minify, but I'd actually have to probably build an app, see how large it is, and you know, I'm, I'm sure it's probably more than a few megs, and 
you know, any JavaScript that I write is probably going to be somewhat less than that too. So, what was the goal on the install? Essentially, yeah, it's it's really the initial download, right? Like, uh, hmm. so like the, the widgets that you install like on the, on the home screen type thing? Um, I haven't seen that yet. Um, I, I would guess no, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I, I haven't seen it anywhere in the docs at least. Um, but if anybody, yeah. Yeah, and, that, and, that, and that's a very good point too, right? Like what, what you've seen of Ionic and what you've seen of its styling, at least at this point in its lifetime, it's, it's very iOS centric, right? Um, I imagine that there might be more on that down the line, but it's hard to say. Yeah, let me let me pull up the there's yeah. Yeah, they they don't. Um, but in terms of Android, maybe maybe there's something that you can maybe do. So, like uh, essentially the 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 ng Cordova that I just showed, it's a fairly new project. Um, it has some very very common wrappings for Angular. Um, for Cordova plugins, and all of those are essentially Cordova plugins that you can add in, right? Um, and so for any like extra functionality that you want that is sort of native specific, um, there's uh, uh, Apache maintains a, a plugin registry for Cordova. So um, I don't know, find plugin, USB, nothing. Yes, so what, what was the question then? Um, I, I think he was asking specifically, um, you know, maybe is yeah. Serial. And 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 we got a good recommendation to search for serial. So one plugin came up. It's a Bluetooth serial plugin for PhoneGap. Works in Android, iOS. It looks like it's for communicating with an Arduino. Right. So Absolutely, and there, there's, well, let's see, there's 240 plugins available in the registry, so um, a lot of these are kind of some of the stuff that we already looked at. Some look to be platform specific, like, you know, Blackberry, that type of thing. Um, <laughs> and I'm guessing these are listed alphabetically because Blackberry is, is quite up on top there. Um, but uh, if, if, there's, if there's some functionality that you're looking for that is native specific that you want to use in an Ionic app, or really any Cordova app, Check the plugin registry. It may not be an ng Cordova for, you know, the goodness that is being able to have wrapped in Angular, but um, you know there is a lot available um, to do that. And 
like you mentioned, you can write your own plugins as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, let me pop into, they, they have a whole testing section. Um, what, one of the ways that I was, uh, I guess, kind of my favorite here, let me just pop into the guide here. They have, they have a whole list of, here we go, testing out your app. Um, so the, the very first option that they list is Ionic Serve, right? Um, because as you type and as you go, you know, you, you get to see the final result there. That doesn't really help with some of the native Cordova stuff though, right? Um, there's also simulator testing, uh, and I kind of, I guess, covered these a little bit before, so you can, you can test it all out in the simulator that's still not on the actual device itself. So um, there's mobile browser testing, so if you do use Ionic Serve and you have the IP address of the, of, uh, the computer that's running that, um, you can go to its port, say, on mobile Safari, um, and see how it looks there as well. You're still kind of lacking some of those native things though because it would just be running in Safari. Um, but then there's testing as a native app. Um, and so in terms of actually running it as a native app um, and then kind of debugging it as you go, I'm not really sure what all is gonna be out there. Um, I know there's probably, I think there's entire companies that make tools for that for native uh, iOS apps. I imagine you would. I imagine you would. I, I don't know how. I don't know how well it would tie into. I guess what's coming out of the web view. Um, I mean, that's that's essentially the fundamental problem. Is, mm -hmm. Yes, you can run an Android app on an Android device using Android Studio, mm -hmm. but that's not going to be good enough to actually run it on an Android device. And when you get an exception, it pops up in Eclipse. You can run an iOS app on an iOS device, and when it gets an exception, it pops up in Xcode. Mm -hmm. But if your JavaScript throws an exception, you're out of luck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I, I imagine, yeah. Oh, I had a question. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, if you had anything to add about. I was just going to say, there's a couple of the, the mobile web testing frameworks that, that mm -hmm. are out there. They're, that, like, you know how you can plug your Android phone in? Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of them that you can actually do by just embedding the JavaScript in your app. Mm -hmm. And I bet you could do something like that and get some testing back and forth. Okay. And actually bring it up in, like, a native console on your yeah. Okay. Um, I, I can look it up. I, I post it as a meetup comment, maybe? Yeah. yeah, yeah, post that in as a meetup comment and can take a look. Either way, if it doesn't exist, you, you all probably have a good startup idea then. Oh, I know. It's a uh, winery. Winery. W-E-I-N-R-E. Like that? Yep. Okay. Web, Web Inspector Remote. Remote. Okay. I'm not sure how well maintained it is still, but. Interesting. Okay. I've used it a few times. It's kind of saved, saved my butt. <laughs> cool stuff. <laughs> awesome. Jay, you had a question? Yeah. Um, completely unrelated. Uh -huh. uh, with, uh, with, with using Angular uh, as powering so much of these applications, mm -hmm. um, depending on how far back you need to support with your browser, sometimes it's recommended to not use uh, element directives and instead just mm -hmm. use attribute or class directives mm -hmm. out of Angular. Is there any risk of using with all of the, the, the cross-platform compatibilities <coughs> with applications, is there any risk of using element directives? Well, ele element directives are mostly a problem on like older IE at this point, at least uh, as far as the pain points that I've seen so far. Um, my basic, and I, I may be wrong in this, but I, I, I'll normally head to like, can I use to, to see exactly what's available, you know, just in general, not just like, being able to use element directives, that type of thing. But um, essentially, I, I, and, and again, I may be wrong on this, but if it's supported by the native browser on the system that you're looking to run, um, I imagine that it would be safe to also use in a web view. Um, you know, anything with like, I guess, the, a, a modern updated operating system in terms of mobile devices, and I'm really, I guess, talking mostly about iOS and Android, um, you're not really you know, gonna have a problem with. Um, I think the big risk you run is what older devices do you wanna support? Um, and then seeing if there's actual incompatibilities there, that type of thing. Um, but then again, like I mentioned earlier too, um, running hybrid apps on older devices, um, 
the speed has really been an issue too. So if you're writing a hybrid app, you're probably on a faster device. And if you're on a faster device, you're probably OK with element tags. Um, but that's definitely something probably worth a little more research too. So that, that would be my first assumption. Yeah, if yeah, if some of them are not as sucky as you might think. Yeah, if if it's if it's slow, it's probably something you don't want to be writing a hybrid app on. And if it is slow, then you're probably running older versions of stuff, and you may come into incompatibilities there. I guess is is the line of thought. Yep. Um, it, uh, I'm pretty sure they're not really that tightly coupled um, the, the at all. Yeah, and and the CSS is totally customizable too. Um, it's all based on SAS, um, and so there are instructions on the Ionic website where, okay, you can take the SAS source and change whatever variables you'd like and and pull it on in. But um, yeah, if, if you were to look through some of the directives. Classes were being called on that too, um, and it's really the the invocation of the directive in the naming of the element that is really giving it the functionality, and not the class. Without the class, it'd probably look awful, I guess. But <laughs> I think it, it it might still work. Any other questions? Anybody who asked a question feel they deserved a pop tart? I have I have two left. That's it. Going fast. Yeah. Oh, you want one? Oh, okay. Hey, <laughs> hey, the question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, di I didn't know it was about a pop tart. <laughs> it's a pleasant surprise. I was saying during the break, I might as well have just been offering like rotisserie chickens or something. <laughs> question or pop tart? Okay. Question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's essentially wherever Cordova is. I mean, I'm sure right now it's being developed and tested using, I guess, the main devices. But um, just remember, all it is is HTML, JavaScript, and CSS as a framework um, living inside Cordova or PhoneGap or whatever you want to use. So you could probably launch it on another device that has a web view that isn't iOS or Android. I don't know how well it would run. Um, but uh, just remember, all it is is JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. It's really Cordova that's kind of giving it the platforms that it that it's on. So, so Ionic uses the Flexbox model, right? It looks like it. I have to look at the code, but. Yeah. Like if you like if you were to want to use it on like a an older device that didn't maybe have Flexbox as part of its native yeah, like web view stuff. Yeah. So what, you just have to roll your own. Was, was the question about using your Flexbox stuff from desktop in Ionic? Uh, or, or was it like, are they using polyfills to make sure that it's runnable wherever? Yeah, I was wondering if they were using polyfills. I don't know if they're using particular polyfills or not. I mean, it sounded like they wouldn't yeah. care the slightest about IE other than whatever the latest is on mm -hmm. the phone. Mm -hmm. um, I would be concerned about the latest on the screen. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Generalize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Anything else before we, uh, before we wrap it up? Are there any prop cards left? What's that? <laughs> yes. Yes. Do you want one? I already have I guess this one's for me then. I don't know. All right. Well, uh, post. Uh, thank you.